proposals in the context of the government's social housing strategy 2020 and NARPs and the possibility of additional loan finance. Uh, and they seemed to indicate, although they were very diplomatic, that there was a kind of a triangle of, of interest between themselves, the Department of Environment and the Department of Finance stroke the central bank. Could you give us your view on, or do you think that that's another viable potential option uh, for lower interest financing, whether for approved housing bodies or local authorities? And then my last question is, because obviously people keep talking about it off balance sheet, but Eurostat has always already ruled very unfavourably to the first significant off balance sheet attempt by government, which is Irish Water. And it's not just in relation to uh, the issue of water charges, there are governance and other issues in that Eurostat judgment. Uh, Eurostat also issued a clarification on the 4th of the 3rd of this year. It was a new note on PPPs, and it talked about kind of retrospectively uh, uh, ruling out certain bodies that may currently be off balance sheet, but if they change their operations, may be put on. And I'm just interested, in terms of the conversations around NARPs, the commitment and the programme for government, are we going to encounter greater difficulties of keeping such a vehicle off balance sheet if it starts to provide greater levels of essentially kind of circuitous funding for uh, social housing off balance sheet? Thanks, Chair. Deputy Gentlemen, a number of very specific questions, and you can decide amongst you who will take the, the various questions. I'll start with the, uh, the fiscal rule questions. Um, so your first one is, is there a debt space under the fiscal rules, specifically the debt reduction rule? Well, the debt reduction rule, as you're, you're aware, requires us to reduce the debt to GDP ratio in excess of 60% of GDP by 1 20th per annum, roughly 5%. 5 um, and, but it's one of three rules. There's the expenditure benchmark and then the, the balance budget rule or the structural balance uh, budget rule. Um, what we have to look at is when you're doing your fiscal policy and what you're going to spend and what you're also going to use for, for tax reductions, uh, you have to look at where you land with all three. And at any give, in any given year, one of the three is going to be the constraint. So normally we're expecting it to be the expenditure benchmark, which limits the amount you can spend uh, unless you raise additional revenue to, to pay for additional spending. Um, but, uh, but other times it will be the structural balance rule. In general, the debt reduction rule, we don't view it as being a constraint uh, for the foreseeable future, primarily because of the nominal growth rates of GDP. So in other words, the heavy lifting on the debt reduction rule was, is going to be done by the growth in the GDP denominator in the calculation. So you're right, there is, if you like, fiscal space under the debt reduction rule. However, um, and, and, and indeed, were you to, to borrow uh, for off-balance sheet, i.e. not interfere with the structural balance rule or the expenditure benchmark, that's a theoretical possibility. However, if you were to borrow and to use it uh, for general government investment or spending, uh, then they would become the constraint. So I hope that explains that. It's, you have to look at all three. Is it, is it, in your view, possible on the basis of the government's projections over the next number of years uh, to increase the absolute level of debt but within the debt reduction rule without disrupting the other two rules, the expenditure benchmark and the structural balance? And if so, by what margin? Well, I'd have to go back and get uh, some of the, the, the bright people to work with me to start figuring out the margin uh, that would be available under that. But the answer is, in theory, yes, provided the money wasn't used for general government expenditure. Because if, if the government chooses to, to use the phrase, to, to, to utilise the maximum available space under the expenditure benchmark, and we're still complying with the structural balance, then that's the limit. If you're borrowing in excess of that, you can't use it for general government expenditure. But for off-balance sheet, that's fine. But we're then back to the, the point that Connor made about the absolute level of debt and, and, uh, and the, whether, whether that's a wise thing to do. In relation to ILCU, yes, the Department of uh, ILCU, the Department of Environment and Department of Finance, there have been discussions. Um, I suppose we would view it essentially, there are certainly there, everyone's engaging in a positive manner. We, ILCU, like any other investor, has to come to us. Like we, we, it, they have to come to us. They'll say we can provide X amount, and we will see what we can do. Obviously. We have to also balance that against taxpayer. You know, the, it is the taxpayer who will pay the interest bill in a lot of cases on this. So we'll have to see: is it a, a fair 
fair for all sides. But I think they are they are still engaging. I think the I think there's uh, some uh, Connor's staff are involved as well. So we're advancing that. I think that's nice. So. Okay. Um, maybe just to uh, come to NARF Deputy and the and the PPP question. Then I mean I think the um, uh, the, the, the you know the. the the possibility of, of having a, a larger version of, of NARPS and a quite an ambitious version of NARPS, you know, I think is uh, is a runner. And I think uh, within that, it would be the local authorities could potentially. I think the AHPs are the current preferred um, uh, 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 supplier of houses, if you like. Obviously, under Part Five, it could be new developments also could 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 go into the into the vehicle. So uh, it could be it could be open ended in that, in that regard. Um, whether there's um, a right to, to buy at the end of the end of the period, or who owns the properties, I think actually in the current lease in in in, in, in the NAMA model, the, the the tenant has a right under the lease to, to buy back the property after 14 years, I believe it is. So so that's in there. But I, I think I'll certainly take that away and have a look as to whether whether you could build something like in. You know, I don't see why I don't see I don't see why not. It just changes the the the, 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 the nature of the vehicle. But I think you can put anything into. In, into how, how you structure it. It just needs to be attractive for, for investors, but I, th I don't see why that would be a problem. I think we'll, we'd also just have to be conscious that anything you do with NAM is so strictly regulated as the state aid clearance that you have to be very careful because any suggestion that NAM could come on balance sheet means any expenditure they engage reduce, eats into just the general public service expenditure. So. I think we're looking at replicating this vehicle over here, essentially taking the... the take. Yeah, standalone, exactly, exactly. Yes, Deputy. And just, just Deputy. The questions that weren't answered, the NDFA PPPs yeah. and the length of time, and then just the, the, the issue about whether we can maintain vehicles off balance sheet in light of the Irish Water ruling and the Eurostat clarification of the PPPs from April or from March. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll take the off balance sheet. Um, it's, it's the old story. Eurostat is completely independent. So in the first instance, in a, in a domestic context, the CSO decides on the treatment, the classification of, 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 uh, of um, these uh, bodies. Uh, and then Eurostat, in what's known as the clarification process, every time they make a return twice a year, the master returns uh, can rule one way or the other. Um, is there any guarantee that they will stay off? No, uh, is, is the answer, because they can come back and look at it. Now, in, in some ways, it's... As long as it's a past event and it gets reclassified uh, on balance sheet, it's not necessarily a huge problem um, because you change the basis, okay? So that it's not just that uh, a body comes in and we have to find the money for that body within the existing if you like, uh, fiscal parameters. You, you change the base as well, so you reflect what they were spending the previous year in the base as, as you move forward. Um, but Eurostat have significant, uh, there's been a significant change thanks to the introduction of uh, ESA 2010, the European System of Accounts 2010. Um, and probably the most significant feature of that, f from what I understand, is that um, it's not just a case of pure rules that you can tick off every rule uh, and every criteria to have something off balance sheet. They also now have the ability uh, to, if you like, look take an overall view of the, the transaction uh, and they can um, decide that, in fact, although you, you fit, you tick every rule, but you're doing it on purpose, specifically for the purpose of trying to avoid having something on balance sheet, they can say, sorry, ultimately that's expenditure that's been done for a public policy good by a, a general government body, so we're saying it's on balance sheet. So, you know, we have to be careful. These, you know, the idea is you, you come up with commercial transactions and then you, you run them by the CSO and if they accept it, then they'll make their return and hopefully your staff will, will accept that. Sorry, Deputy, you referred to um, the PPP, the new PPP uh, guidance from the EU. Um, I think you, you're probably aware, Minister Howden, the outgoing Minister of Public Expenditure Reform, wrote directly to the EU to complain about this, and I think there is some discussion ongoing with other like-minded countries about that, those revisions that happened. So, and just specifically on the, um, the the current PPP on on social housing and why 2019, 2020, and uh, why does it take so long? And their commencement dates are they? 
notional commencement dates for those first 500 units. Completion dates. Completion dates. Yeah, yeah. So they, those have to be ready and built ready for somebody to move into them in 2019, 2020. But the, that's the first bundle, which is just three bundles of 500, and the first bundle has has, has gone through. That neither neither bundle two or bundle three has even started yet. Uh, it, the issue, I believe, is the identification of sites and clean sites from, from, from the local authorities, essentially, and, and you have to have clean title and, and the identification of those sites to go into the vehicle that ultimately gets the private capital. That, I believe, is a constraint. In general, though, uh, while PPPs do look very slow, uh, it's, the, it's the public procurement side of that that is the slow part. So public procurement it is that's extraordinary. It's exceptionally long, even by our long-winded public procurement processes. It's extraordinary, and, and one of the issues is legal challenge. Uh, legal challenge is uh, uh, very common, as we know. The state is currently being uh, challenged in relation to uh, Grange Gorman, uh, where the 200 million P uh, PPP has been delayed for a couple of years. Students haven't uh, been able to move on to the campus, and that's a legal challenge being taken against the state in relation to the process itself. So, it's very technical, it's very laborious, and uh, is open to challenge. And uh, this, the whole process has slowed down and in fact people also now are disinclined to even participate in the process because of the length of time and uh, so I think there's uh, certainly some flaws there and, uh, and it's an extraordinarily slow system deputy. Could you count? Uh, thanks chair and uh, thanks for your presentation gentlemen. Um, firstly can I say I, I welcome the, what you said there in relation to funding and uh, loans being made available to local authorities and to private developers in the form of bonds or whatever that might be. And I would ask you to inform the committee when you expect that to be initiated, when will those funds be available. Uh, you know, private developers cannot access funds on a, at a competitive rate in the marketplace at present. They need to do so. The, 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 the alignment uh, with investment funds and government funds um, you know, is not meeting the requirement. The rates they're charging are, are, are no better than the mezzanine funds that are there presently. So it's, it's, it's paramount and essential uh, that that process begin. Now, it's, you know, we, we all acknowledge, and all the stakeholders, and everybody associated with this issue acknowledges that the housing and homelessness situation is a crisis, is an emergency. We also acknowledge what you've said and what others have said, and this debate has been going on for the last number of years now, that conventional methods, convention, conventional funding models, and especially in the context of fiscal rules, as you've outlined, uh, are, not longer, are no longer viable. It has, there has to be an overhaul, and there has to be an, an extraordinary investment in housing, in the construction sector, in order for this issue to be resolved in a manner in which we can all stand over and be happy about. The special vehicle that you mention, and, and NARPS has been successful and has the potential to be successful in its own right within the confines of NAMA and the constraints associated with it by virtue of the overhanging legislation associated with NAMA. And that can progress, and that's something for government and ourselves and everybody who has, whom has an interest to, in, to seek to ensure that the social dividend that was expected from NAMA, in addition to the commercial dividend, uh, can be achieved. And that is one avenue for which it can. But it has served a purpose insofar as it has and you've acknowledged yourself, provided a recognition that there is the potential for such a vehicle, maybe a housing authority per se, that you can fund and that it, it then can act as, 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 as a means of supplying further funding or purchasing units, as you've said, or building units and providing to local authorities to approve housing bodies and indeed to the colleges. And I think that's something, again, that we need to stop talking about, we need to put in place and we need that to be an initiation that needs to be policy, and it needs to be driven by government. And I don't appreciate, with the best of will in the world, uh, members of the committee asking you to go back and, and, and come back to us. I think government have to take this by the scruff of the neck now on foot of this committee's deliberations and the debate that has been going on for so long now to bring forward policy, to bring forward uh, means and methods by which this issue can be addressed in its first 100 days as it said itself. And we are feeding into that process, and I think it's incumbent on this committee uh, to, to acknowledge that that is, a, that is a way in which this can be addressed. That is a way in which extraordinary funding can be uh, channeled into the right avenues for this issue to be addressed. And, you know, despite, and I acknowledge what Deputy Durkin says on a, on a regular basis, his love affair with local authorities in the conventional ways and means by which they sought to address the housing crisis in each local authority. 
unfortunately, the rules and the regulations and the, 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 the you know, governing the spending of public funds unfortunately does not allow us to make the sort of capital investment that is needed to address this. That's, 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 that's the bottom line. But they should. It, well, they can't. But they have and, you to. Know, and some would argue it's because of that we, 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 won't, be, we won't revisit the unfortunate uh, you know, fiscal bombs we've had in the past. And, and you know, the other thing then, you know, Deputy Bryn, you know, mentioned it to you in relation to Eurostat and its ruling on these vehicles um, and the, their commerciality, so to speak. I think, you know, you have to differentiate between, you know, return investment over 10 years or 20 years. As you said yourself, in relation to the lease period uh, to these, whether it's local authorities, approved housing bodies or colleges or whomever it may be, that 20 years is, a, is, is, is an appropriate length of time. Well, it's an appropriate length of time for a return on investment too. And that's something that should be you know, stipulated. That's something that should be acknowledged by those in authority in making a decision to run with this model. Because I believe it's the only show in town. It's the only way in which this can be addressed in the manner in which it, it has to be. Because there has to be, as I said, extraordinary effort, extraordinary funding, extraordinary commitment in order for this and everybody needs to be on the same hymn sheet in order to address this. And the rules governing uh, government spending are such now that we would not be able to invest as we would want, as we would need in a crisis or an emergency. And because of that, we have to put in place a housing authority similar to that of NARPS as a vehicle to help and assist all those other uh, pieces of the jigsaw that can make this right. And I, I would ask you to insist to government in your deliberations with them, that that is a means to an end. Do you want to comment on? Deputy, <coughs> no. Is there is there a specific question there? Specific question, but I think that the time the time for questions the time for questions are, are over, and I think you've acknowledged that yourself. And acknowledged that yourself. The time for questions are over. What are we sitting here for? Time for solutions and there's one. I suppose, De uh, Deputy Count, look, next week we'll be starting on the deliberations and some of those will be the recommendations. Before I go to the next uh, colleague, if, if, if you do want to comment on anything, I think he, Deputy Count said. Or I, suppose, I suppose just on the financing model, yes, we're conscious it is. And look, there is it is important that there is a risk, the cost of the, of the finance and there is a risk premium charged because otherwise then you get into the point into a difficulty of potentially subsidies to individual market operators with the on balance sheet risk do you, think, do you think it could be it will be construed that a 20 year return on investment is not sufficient and does not yield the sort of return that would be applicable uh, to, to, to meet the, the guidelines I don't you know, certainly I yeah, think there was a lot of other issues in relation to yeah, Irish water as yeah. it's, I think as it gets long, the longer the return on investment, then it, you just have to be careful that there is actually a, a good return because obviously that can, you can see some ways the, a lot of the EIB proposals or projects are structured much longer term because their cost of funding is so much lower. So they do are generating a commercial return, but maybe not a market, a private market commercial return, market return. Mr. Kelly, one, one point, Deputy. Uh, the, um, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. The, you know, the financial model that we've used in the past, in relation to uh, certainly house building, as, as, uh, isn't, isn't uh, appropriate in the future. Interesting in the UK that um, uh, before before the crisis, 25% of uh, homes were built by publicly quoted house building companies, and today that's 75%. So uh, you know they've they've seen a big shift in in how they they're still building the same amount of uh, homes actually as they did in 2007 today, but built through a completely different uh, financial model. And I think ultimately we'll have to see that kind of uh, institution exist, permanent financing vehicles whose business it is to own development land, build houses, planning. They've got you know they've got, and, and they take all they take they take the risk as well, and they're and they're in it for the long term, irrespective of. Of the cycles, and I think that tends to lessen the volatility of the cycle when participants are are doing that. I I would hope that you know in in, in the medium term, if we're, if we're to have a a, a better functioning uh, housing market in the long term, we'll probably need to see those kind of uh, publicly quoted vehicles and private vehicles uh, sim similarly uh, established. Thank you, Deputy Coppinger. Um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to tease out why 
a fund that was a pension reserve fund that was paid for by the, the public has now become the Irish Strategic Investment Fund and we're basically being told that it can't really be used for social housing. I'm trying to tease out for people who actually watch the Housing Committee um, as to why that's the case. So the Irish Strategic Investment Fund uh, has to have a commercial return, right? But that was a political decision, obviously, because it was a fund that we had. So the EU was no say over it. It was a political decision by the last government to, to do that. But by commercial return, does a certain percentage profit have to be made on every single investment that it makes? I'm just wondering, is it laid down in legislation anywhere, or is it just policy? Is there anything to preclude this fund from directly building social housing or even affordable housing? Um, because the list of projects that you've given obviously don't focus on social or affordable housing, they're private housing. Uh, and I'll go into a couple of them in a minute. Um, I just think people would be mystified out there as to how there's meant to be consensus that the most strategic need in this country at the moment is housing, but yet the Strategic Investment Fund isn't really being used for housing. Um, now, when this came up in the doll, the NTMA bill, um, the Socialist Party at the time put amendments to it to include housing on the list of projects. We were told by the the then junior minister sitting to my left, um, who, uh, that this couldn't be done except if it was done as a PPP or as a non-state. You know, so this needs to be teased out. Now, other parties disagreed, obviously, and did vote for those amendments. But my point is that political decisions were taken only two years ago. Right now, this fund is, is, is being dispersed and it's not being used for social housing. There's 5.4 billion left. Just theoretically, how many social homes could that 5.4 billion build if the brief of the I, ISIF and the NTMA was changed by a political decision made by the majority in the Dáil? It's a bit laughable, Deputy Cowan, asking them to go and talk to the government. Like, it's the doll that's meant to be making this decision. As to how these people are meant to be following the decisions of the elected representatives of the country. Not Like, they're, most of them, no offence, are, are from a banking background in, in the NTMA. Um, so, I'm just saying it's meant to be us telling them, and the doll telling them what to do in this housing committee. So... If theoretically there was direct labour used, for example, that would cut out the middleman, you know, of the private company that has to be paid the, the profit, and if large scale economies, which we heard about from the housing agency, you know, you buy in bulk your, your baths and your showers and your whatever other things, theoretically a house could be built for 100,000. In fact, a lot of the houses that are needed are two bedroom houses anyway, or one bed units or whatever. So, in my estimation, 50,000 social or affordable homes could be built by the Irish Strategic Investment Fund if this doll took a decision to do that, and um, if the majority of the Iraq has voted for it. Now, you've mentioned two housing initiatives, three actually you're involved in. I just want to ask you about two of them. Activate Capital, because this is, again, taxpayers' money, £325 million that you've handed over, and Ardstone Capital, £25 million. So, Activate Capital, the, the CEO... Um, it, it, by coincidence, is the former AIB and Ulster Bank executive uh, who appeared at the banking inquiry, and also Dan O'Connor, uh, who's the chair, is the ex AIB chairman. Now, I think these points are relevant. These are people that recklessly gambled um, huge amounts of money. In the case of Ulster Bank, had to be bailed out by 15 billion from the UK taxpayer. In the case of AIB, we know. Uh, get, had to be dragged, pulling and, and screaming about f truthful information about their solvency. But the NTMA thinks it's fine that they're involved in spending the Irish Strategic Investment Fund. Did you not have any pause for thought about that? Um, so the first, one of the first deals of Activate I'm aware of because there's a development taking place in, in my own constituency. So um, Sean Riley McGarrell was one of the first people you invested in, one of the Maple Anglo 10 all back in business, having been cleaned out by NAMA. Very nice to see him back on his feet with his loans written down by 153 million. Um, he's building houses now in Hansfield SDZ, which again is laughable. It was meant to be set up as a strategic development zone to fast track housing. But it's all 
obviously private housing with 10% possibly. He's just jacked up the price of a two bedroom house from 220 to 240,000. I mean, this is how the, this public fund is being used in all the old ways, you know, with all the same old people being involved. And I, I wonder if you have any comment. And just finally on the whole off balance sheet um, debate, this is just a question for the, um, uh, well it applies to all of them, but I suppose to the Department of Finance. Um, when the NTMA was set up, we were told again the money couldn't be used for social housing. Um, but again, I believe that was a political decision. There's no international rule um, that's preventing us. But two years later, we're still being told that this elusive off-balance sheet model is being developed. Where? All of the evidence now is, and other speakers, uh, Deputy O'Brien and others, have mentioned. For example, um, Michelle Norris at the Housing Finance Agency in a lecture last week. The PPPs are being recategorised. You know, it's just impossible to fit in with this off-balance sheet model if you're working on the basis of existing revenue. Um, in Britain now, all housing agency debt is being classed as state debt. Um, so the Department of Finance itself and its new funding models in a letter to the Minister said no new model will be capable of meeting this off-balance sheet mirage. So the only way, and Mr Palmer said it in his introduction, um, I, I rushed down, I hope it's an accurate quote, the money can, sorry, um, unless you raise additional revenue to pay for the additional spending, you said. Um, so that is the only thing that we can do. If people keep operating on the basis of the existing cake and not a bigger cake, we cannot fund social and affordable housing in this country based on the EU fiscal straitjacket that this government and others signed up for. So, but would you agree that you could, for example, introduce housing taxes on the basis of, for example, a 3% wealth tax on millionaires or anything over a million? You could increase corporation tax or at least bring in the 12.5% and use it to pay for housing. You know, that there are loads of measures that could be taken by taxing wealth in this country to pay for it. Now you could also use whatever you've left in the NTMA and you could use the 2.8 billion that NAMA has in cash reserves and build housing as well. But there are other ways but it has to be done with raising revenue if we're to comply with the EU rules. Thank you Deputy. A number of questions there for you. Um, well, I, I suppose I'll start off the, the I think, definitely, as you're aware, the, the Irish Strategic Investment, Ireland's Strategic Investment Fund, was essentially, as you said, the, la the previous government's um, a commitment of the previous government, and was enacted by the 2014 um, NTMA Amendment Act. I think the reason why, if it was used now, f without it's it's. Once it's the expenditure that is in, that impacts the fiscal rules, so any spending by it on an on balance sheet activity essentially will eat into what can be spent from other public services because essentially it will be it will be impacting on the expenditure benchmark rule. Um, in terms of the actual housing construction policy, I, that is a matter really for the government as a whole and the minister for housing in terms of the delivery mechanisms they want. We, of course, are here to support trying to identify better financing, what, where you can increase the delivery in terms of st structuring it differently. And I think that's why we're talking about the off-balance sheet, because you can do a lot more if you can keep it off-balance sheet. Um, the um, social housing, sorry. How do you do an off-balance sheet is the question that we're asking. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and if, if you take, um, I think, we sent over, a, there's a French example which we think, but it's affordable, and I, you're right, Deputy, it is very difficult to keep social housing off balance sheet. It's affordable housing where they generate sufficient um, commercial return because they're charging near market rents that that services the debt which has been, which has been bought, I think it's a 2.3 billion fund, it's essentially 500 million from the EIB, billion euro from the state, French state, 800 million from private debt investors, and essentially what it does is it's effectively a subsidised housing model, but it's affordable because they have to generate sufficient commercial return to finance that. Um, I think, sorry, on the, the, the yeah, charging, just, 
Yeah, just pick up a couple of points, Deputy, if I, if I may. Just on the, um, you asked about the return on the ISA commercial return. How is that rate set, or, or what is it? So you're right. It is. It, is a, it can be a blend, depending on the, the risk of any particular investment. Can be. Um, uh, uh, it, it, it varies depending on that. But the the essential number to bear in mind is the average cost of all of our debt uh, is 3.1 percent. So that's come down from about 3.4 percent. So if you think about the fact that we have this debt over here and, and, and this cash here, we certainly want to be making a return in excess of the average cost of our uh, debt uh, total. So that puts a 3.1 percent um, you know, minimum return. Otherwise, we'd be losing money as a, as a taxpayers. So, so it's uh, around 4 percent is deemed to be the commercial return. But it can be a blend. So it can be lower. Uh, uh, it can be higher. Um, in terms of all, all of the, the, you know, the fund, as I said, it, it does have some social housing component in terms of, the, first of all, the property element of the portfolio, you know, we need to have it diversified. I mean, I think uh, we've learned the, the difficulties of uh, having all our eggs in, in, in one basket. I think as a fund, I'd always be advocating diversification across different sectors, across different regions. There is a component of property that's appropriate uh, for the fund within that. Um, we want to make sure that that's diversified as well. Um, and uh, you've heard us talking about the NARPS initiative, which is a, a social housing initiative, which could be, could be very substantial. And uh, uh, so uh, just to make that point, in terms of I don't want to comment any of the individuals involved in terms of uh, the, the projects that we, we have backed. But when we, when, we, when we put money into these projects, it's uh, 325 million into that fund. Um, the money is drawn down as it's, as it's needed, so we, doesn't, uh, we, haven't, we haven't sunk it away somewhere. We, it gets drawn down as it's required, and uh, only 60 million has been drawn down so far in total, so our proportion of that is about 35, and the rest of it, um, you know, we, we, we still have. It's committed to them, but only if they can meet the criteria and only if they're going to build the houses and develop uh, as their business plan has suggested. And we have all sorts of covenants in there that if they are not doing their job, that money gets withdrawn and, uh, and gets brought, brought back in. Uh, in terms of management and, and who they are, we, we, we need them to have expertise and experience, of course, and uh, that's a, a, a critical component in any investment decision. Um, when the NTMA was being set up, we raised, for example, there should be representatives on it of people who've been affected by the housing crisis. By the more, ex, you can have expertise in mortgages, etc., without being a former banker. You know, it, it, this just seems to be a, a catch-all for putting the same people who brought the economy to a standstill, who have cost the state so much, into key positions in the NTMA and now in other investment companies. <clears throat> when the NTMA was set up, we raised with um, the minister at the time the that there should be representatives on the NTMA, advocates of people affected by the housing crisis. The whole point of the NTMA was the debt that we'd incurred, and the people who incurred the debt end up getting positions now through money that's been invested by the NTMA, which I think is a bit ironic. I don't have any comment to make on okay. the board. No, that's fair enough. Yes. Yeah. Directors. Okay. Sorry, Timothy, you're great. Uh, I, I want to continue because I've been. Uh, well, the second yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Deputy Brophy. Um, might actually tie in with uh, um, something because I want to go back to Deputy O'Brien's comments to you on one particular aspect in your answer uh, in relation to that, and that was the debt space um, that you talked about, and particularly the ability. Uh, to make a judgment as to whether you could increase the amount of debt. Um, I effectively, if you short circuit out the answer that I took from what you said, um, which would worry me, is effectively it's a, it's a maxing out of the state's credit card again, is what you're looking at if, if you go down that route. So you're talking about looking at the savings that are there and then possibly going back to see how much you could increase borrowing to spend on housing. Um, and obviously, I'd just like to, to clarify, is that exactly what you meant by that answer, that uh, there would be an, an increase, effectively, in, um, in, in borrowing? Because I think that's something we need to be very conscious of and need to understand exactly where we're going with that. Um, the other thing I wanted to particularly ask you about is you mentioned, obviously, about the um, ability to set up a vehicle that would look at the... Um, getting the voluntary housing associations involved and um, the, the way in which that would work as distinct from the current situation where they access funding through the HFA. 
Um, my experience, while not quite as negative as Deputy Durkin and the Voluntary Housing Associations, is that they are not interested in ramping up to anything near or close to the area um, that um, you would need them to be at to, to, to address the problem. And for a variety of reasons, like most of them just don't want to do it. They, they don't want to go there. So I'm interested how you think any other vehicle um, would actually achieve that uh, to bring them on board. Um, and the other, um, I suppose the last thing is, uh, you know, that I was very interested in that French uh, model you made reference to there because listening to my understanding is I think Eurostat is not interested anymore in anything being off balance sheet. I, I, I think with due respect to, to ourselves and to the imagination of very creative people when it comes to trying to keep stuff off balance sheet, I believe that the starting premise that they address the problem is, is that, nope, we're not going to grant that, and no matter what you say, that will be the answer that comes back. Um, would you agree with that assessment, that, that there is effectively an almost total, total block on the potential in the future for something to come from this country in this area and be viewed as an off-balance sheet vehicle? Thank you, Deputy. Um, I'll, I'll answer your, your first question there. Um, what I was trying to say is that um, assuming we have put forward fiscal plans that comply with the structural balance rule and the expenditure benchmark, okay, uh, then all things being equal, given the, the, the way GDP is growing, there will be no problem complying with the debt reduction rule. Okay, and I think this is what Deputy Abram was, was driving at. So, yes, at that point, in theory, you could borrow additional money and still comply with the debt reduction rule. Uh, and I just did a rough back of the envelope calculation there. In, in theory, in 2017, we need to reduce the, the in, in GDP terms, we need to reduce the debt ratio by about 1.4% overall. Uh, we currently have a, a projection of 2.7. Okay, so if you like, the 2.7 reflects the, the fiscal plan. So there's a gap there uh, between the two. Um, if you then use that money for general government expenditure, you immediately put yourself into problems with the expenditure benchmark and probably the structural balance rule as well. Okay, but if you use that money for other purposes uh, that were deemed commercial, then that would be a possibility. But you're right, the debt would go up, general government debt would go up. All right. And then, I mean, just, just a, a further point on that, um, uh, as was already mentioned, the ISIF has 5.4 billion that it hasn't committed yet. So. Why would you borrow when you've got that money? Why would you want to borrow? Why, why would you want to increase debt? <laughs> yeah, but uh, th that's the. I'm saying technically, it, it's 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 possible. Yeah, that's what it's, yeah, it's very much John's point. You need to be very careful of the on, on balance sheet borrowing. I think that's the point we're made. Just given you know rates can change very quickly, and we've had very recent experience of that. In terms of the Eurostat, French model, we again it goes to your point. There isn't definitive, a definitive view on whether that's on or off balance sheet. Um, we understand certainly the way it's structured looks like it's going to an attempt to bring an off balance sheet. And look, I think we have to work within the rules and assume that we can, so long as we adhere to the regulations. And as John pointed out, there is this catch-all that we're not deliberately. And but so in putting forward a proposition, that's why the commercial return is such a key element of it, because it does illustrate that it is a commercial, um, it may not be a market return, but it's a commercial return, and that is allowable in terms of delivering on uh, kind of essentially housing or another element of key uh, capital infrastructure for the state. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, I'm mean, one for the point about Eurostat um, and, and what they do. You've got to remember they're also operating in a, in a Europe-wide environment, uh, so precedents are very important. So if, if this French model flies, then yes, it's a good precedent, and we can look, can we can we replicate it, uh, and that's excellent. Um, the the converse is true, though, as well, that things you come up with that might just about fly and all the rest, Eurostat may not be willing to let go forward because of the precedent it would set for other countries, and it may be too close to a barrier for them, if you know what I mean. So it's, it's just it's a very complicated environment. Um, you can try things, but uh, ultimately the, the final decision-making is, is outside our control.
Mr. O'Kelly, the, the AHBs and why what, and they're, they're, they're not keen to, to borrow. Is that, was that the point? My understanding is they're not keen to borrow. Yeah. They're not keen to ramp up. I, I they're not, and it's 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 more fundamental than they're not keen to borrow. I believe that they're not keen to ramp up. So we, we have another a number of agencies that are at a size and a point which they're actually comfortable with. And what we have is we have a direct clash because we have state agencies and yourselves and you know even the HFA effectively and through very good cost effective offerings trying to push the agencies to a point. But I mean I use the analogy without being in any way disparaging if if, if someone's comfortable at running a corner spa shop, they don't want to be done stores. And no amount of good, solid money made available to them at very low rates necessarily will make them want to change what it is they do. So how does your proposition, how do you think that they will buy into something like that if you have that almost natural resistance there? Um, the, 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 the way the NARPS work, uh, model has worked in, in NAM, and I think maybe why it's worked, is that the approved housing bodies haven't wanted to, to borrow more money than they, for, for either behavioural reasons or capacity reasons or, 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 or whatever it is. And so uh, you know, we, we have bought the, this vehicle in NAM has bought the uh, uh, property for them. So all they're doing is enter into a lease, so they're seeing the demand. So they're, they're really in the business that, that they're in, which is identifying uh, properties that they have a demand for. And, uh, and the risk gets taken by the vehicle and the borrowing is done by the vehicle. So I suppose that has proven to be um, successful. There's about 1,100 uh, homes in, in, this, um, in this vehicle right now. Uh, and it started off as just a, a facilitation, you know, as part of NAMA's business. But I think the growth in it does demonstrate that there, there, there is some demand there for it. And uh, so that's why we're, uh, we're hopeful that that, that that might be the case. Can I, can I just, it still doesn't address fundamentally what I believe is the problem, that you talk about a thousand homes, when in actual fact we're talking about the solutions in the tens of thousands. And that is the key problem, that the, 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 the agencies are not willing to go anywhere close to what is the, the level of the solution. And it's not just, uh, I believe, the, the point you've outlined there in relation to the, the borrowing and in relation to incurring a debt or whatever. It's they just don't want to go to that size. And I don't think that solution, therefore, for them in any way, is the solution that solves the problem. So. There's no I mean, that's idea. From, from our point of view, I suppose we've been asked to concentrate on trying to find financing solutions. I mean, that, that's where, where our uh, um, expertise and experience lies. And outside of that, uh, if there are other blockages, then uh, uh, maybe somebody else would be more expert than, 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 than I would. Thank you. Deputy O'Dowd. Uh, apologies for being late. Uh, I'll just say it's been a very interesting debate, the part that I've heard of it. I just want to say a few things, if I may. First of all, um, Obviously, the crisis is there. We have the land, we have the capacity to build, we have the people who want to go into the houses, and we have different ways of finding the finance, some that will work and some that won't, obviously. So it seems to me the best thing to do is to get all the heads together. I mean, all of the expertise, which you mentioned, um, you talked about uh, experience in France and other places, uh, to find a way to do it. And I think it's just a matter of finding that way, I think. Now, it's, it's, it, of course, it's getting around the rules. But one thing it seems to me that you have a lot of... Uh, investment funds, say pension funds in other countries. So Canada is often mentioned to me. I don't know if it's ever mentioned to you people, but that there's a lot of money out there uh, that, that people want to invest in countries like Ireland into solid, you know, 20-year, 30-year investment funds but with a low return, but nevertheless a, a, a significant and constant return. And would you think, you know, should we be chasing those funds in terms of getting a, a you talk about a new vehicle or whatever organisation or whatever it is that we should be going out and saying, look, uh, we have plan information for X amount of houses here. You know, we can guarantee an income of, of Y. You know, will you put it into this? Can you can you build and we lease back? Can you build or, and we rent long term? Are you look? Is that something that ought to be looked at? Because it seems to me it's an obvious way of getting significant investment uh, that the state doesn't have to provide, but benefits directly and immediately uh, to citizens who want to live live in those houses. And I, I, to me, that that's 
that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the other issue is that the question of uh, this country suffered greatly uh, as a result of the financial collapse. And in fact, the euro is there, I think, particularly because of what happened in this country, that the issues that we had to deal with and the way we dealt with them now has our country, I think, seventh internationally in the league of, of, of most efficient economies. So is it not time? Uh, to have a social dividend you know, from, from the EU as a result of everything that we've done, as a result of obeying all the rules. Uh, and if I'm right, in the programme for government, there's a sort of an indirect reference at least to, to, you know, to, to representations as regards to housing to, to the European Union. Is there, is, is there potential there uh, for, you know, for, for, for seeking uh, a separate and significant, uh, you know, leeway for us in the question of, of meeting these needs because the impact of the recession apart from the huge job losses has been in the appalling misery which tens of thousands of people are living in now and I think we're entitled, uh, we're, we're entitled to that dividend uh, and the, the other point that I, I wish to make is, um, is you know um, we have an awful lot of state land like local authorities, CIE, DSB, whatever and I know an inventory is done on that land, and um, I just sort of feel that we're, you know, we should be moving in there. I know it's perhaps not a matter for you to comment on, but if you take, I keep going back to, 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 to Gormanstown Camp, which is about 200 acres state-owned land. It was proposed years ago that I think 60 acres of that uh, would be used for social housing and, and affordable housing. But you know, we need, I think we need, and this is not a criticism, we need new thinking in, in our departments uh, to sort of push new solutions that we haven't thought about and to push to the limit all of the, all of the, all of the assets that we have that we could use, uh, particularly for affordable and social housing. Mr. Kelly, Mr. Dorgan. Yeah, just just uh, on, on the, uh, no, I think you're right in terms of um, you know, the availability of uh, private capital, international capital, institutional investors, and I mean I suppose that's you know, part of what we're trying to stimulate uh, in this sector, which has uh, been evident in the commercial property sector and, as I mentioned earlier, is evident in, in the UK. I mean, they, part of the ISIS uh, mandate is to, is, to, is to have co-investors, so of the 2.4 billion that the Strategic Investment Fund has invested to date, that's been matched by a multiplier of two and a half times so there's, uh, because of the co-investment. So that's equated to uh, almost seven billion in investment in the country when you bring in the co-investors. And, and we always look to, to, to have co-investors as part of any investment we make. So if you take the Activate proposal, KKR were the, were the, were the investor. You take the Ardstone investment was Aviva Insurance Company and on Post Pension Fund. Uh, you take the DCU uh, investment in the housing, that attracted the EIB in. So you've got institutional investors right across, they're, they're right across the risk spectrum, you know, and, and, we need, and you need investors right across the risk spectrum because on post pension fund or Aviva will be on the conservative end and you'll have other people at the, at the higher risk end. So I think, um, you know, I think you're right. I think th that's the kind of investment we need to try and find. But, they, you know, they need to see a platform. Uh, to, 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 you know, that's established that, 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 that they can come into. And I think that's what, um, you know, that's what we're trying to look at right now. I suppose just on the, um, the program for government commitments, um, I suppose there for others to take forward and certainly the state-owned land where, where there, there can be kind of a change of land, I think it's probably more appropriate to the Minister for Housing and the Minister for Public Expenditure Reform who sits over OPW who probably holds a lot of that land. Could just go back on that. I, I acknowledge what you're saying there, but how how hard are we pushing that? How, you know, in terms of saying going after those funds for housing. How, you know, what, what do we do? Is the ISIF following that? Or? Yeah, I mean, we are we are very actively looking looking at this space, and uh, you know, yeah. we're engaged with the, all of the participants, and we'll we'll we'll, we'll talk to anybody. Uh, and is there joined up thinking between the ISIF and the environment and? You know, how, how, uh, how, how we've had all the agencies in here, and I must say they're, they're all focused, absolutely. But how much how, how do you meet? You know, how, what sort of structure is there between 
between what your fund and, and say, the Department of the Environment? There's, there's a lot of engagement with, with yes, all of the course. stakeholders in terms of uh, in terms of the NTMA. I mean, we do everything through the Department of Finance in terms of uh, that's our that's our uh, yeah. reporting uh, a department who reports right. to the Minister for Finance, obviously. And then, but outside of that, um, you yeah, there's a. Uh, there's a lot of interaction and a lot of uh, a lot of working together, and that's. Are, are that's there, is there a common organisation? Is there, in other words, do you, uh, or would it be, if there isn't one already, would it make sense to have to have a cross uh, a cross agency department uh, committee meeting regularly that we're meeting to to sort of push all the ideas forward? I suppose, I suppose all, there has been groups like that, but I suppose all of the the. The top group now, of course, is the Cabinet Subcommittee on um, on Housing, um, which, in a sense, that supersedes all of those previous uh, structures. So you have a senior, as you know, the senior officials sure. group beneath that as well now, sure. which draws on the expertise from across um, the public service. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Collins. Yeah, um, I'd probably like to make a longer statement, but I know this is about questions, um, so we'll try and keep it fairly succinct. I think the problem here is that we haven't really addressed the issue of social housing. Um, all this is directed towards private financing for private developers to build houses that will probably cost about 300, 350,000 euro. People can't access that. And we haven't really come to the nub of how we address this. Um, and listen to what you're saying about the restrictions and the IS, the strategic investment fund, and how you have to have all these structures and balances and all that sort of thing. But it is developing. You mentioned about France. I'm hearing through the grapevine that in Austria now they have a, an Austrian housing social, uh, social agency, or a housing agency who has been given money to build 30,000 social housing units. Now, that is happening. So why aren't we hearing about that? Why aren't we finding out exactly how that's been structured and how they, they got that? So I think from the committee's point of view is, is getting that information, bringing that into the debate when you're doing your wrap-up um, and, and proposing that, and, and also the Department of Finance looking at what's going on there in the European-wide um, situation very, very, very quickly and getting on top of it, because you said things seem to be changing all the time. And I mean, if, if a country is getting money directly for social housing, that's where we should be as well. Thank you, Deputy. I'm going to ask: it, Are you aware of the, the issue in Austria? Yeah, to be honest, uh, one of the officials we work with has been kind of having a look at across different European countries, and he certainly he had done prepared some material on Austria. So I'd have to t check in with him. In terms of, I suppose. Our key avenue in the Department of Finance, where the European Investment Bank is quite a useful tool, because if you're looking for finance for any of these, it it um, you tend to route it through the European Investment Bank. Which, okay, so yeah, we have a group, a very small group, who kind of look through the proposals that have gone, and then if they see something that looks interesting, they send it on, whether it's SME credit or housing. The idea is just to see, as John mentioned earlier on, I think just to count precedent is a very useful way of getting rolling something out. So if we if we see something that we think might be of interest to another department, we'll send it on to them and see if they want to advance it. Mr. Norton, a bid to be helpful to the committee. The last time Minister Noonan was here, he spoke about the French model, and you've subsequently yeah. sent yeah. on some information. If you have anything further in relation yeah. to what Deputy Collins, you might send it on yes. by mean correspondence. Yeah. And Deputy Collins, I'd make sure you get it as, as well. Deputy O'Sullivan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just following on from what Deputy Collins was talking about, um, we're being told that this off-balance sheet is, if not the only player, but certainly the main player in addressing funding for the housing situation. Um, you said that your role is finding, financing solutions to this, but yet we have a housing crisis that requires a wider look at how that finance is going to be used. Um, and we know that social housing is a vital component of that and it needs very significant funding. And it can't just be the 10% that um, has been agreed. So while you're saying it's a financing, so financing solution, it, there's also a whole bigger social aspect to that. And I don't understand why between the two of you that is not being addressed when you're looking at, at these solutions. Um, that's one. Second one is on the loan portfolios in relation to properties that are being sold off. 
and we know that this is causing great fear and great tension for people who are in those housing estates. We met the residents from Tyrrellstown a week or two ago. Do you not have a role in perhaps, inter not in, well, I have to be careful the words I use, but that could, could finance from yourselves not be found to secure those loans instead of where they're going? Um, could you just clarify, did I hear you right saying that you would purchase housing if it was identified by the local authority? Um, I wasn't sure if I picked that up right. And the other one then is on the on -cam the, the, your engagement with DCU. Is that funding for all on-campus on accommodation? Thanks. Thank you, Deputy. A number of questions, Mr. O'Kelly, Mr. Dorgan. <coughs> DCU is on-campus, Deputy. Yeah. Yeah, Three thousand units, and just in terms of the, uh, um, the NARPS model that's been discussed, so 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 the NTM are working on a, on a couple of two new new ideas. One is the infrastructure fund, where we would uh, fund infrastructure that that could be social housing, or it could be it, it doesn't uh, make any difference that that, uh, that could be freed up for e either or. And in terms of the NARPS vehicle that we're looking at replicating, that is a social housing vehicle. The, the time frame for that. I mean, we, we've been talking about our housing crisis for over five years, yeah. and it's worsening as we're talking about it. And certainly the past few weeks, we've become very aware of so many other aspects to it. But the longer we talk, the greater the crisis is becoming, and there are more people becoming homeless and adding to the list. So where is the urgency for both of your organisations in getting the solutions that will see a real difference? Well, we're ready to go. Mr. I just clarify in relation to, because you hit on a point that has come up, I suppose, very specifically in relation to NARPs, uh, as, as a NARPs 2, we'll call it, um, because it's outside the NAMA one, a new model. For our understanding as a committee, accessing the funds aren't the issues, it's the technical cons construction of NARPs 2, first of all. And you're saying now you can do that more or less immediately. Is that correct? Technically, it's not, it's not difficult. It's already in existence within the NAMA structure. So we'd be essentially copying it. We know it works. Uh, we, know, we know also in terms of as a vehicle, administratively, you know, we could replicate it. And uh, it's not a new idea. Therefore, we're not uh, worried about whether it won't work. I know uh, the, the other deputy had a view that yeah. it, it wouldn't be as scalable as we thought. But from a financing point of view, um, you know, you could, the, the ISIF could invest 250 million, you could have uh, additional 250 million, you could, you could, it could be 500 million, it could be a billion, and it could continue to grow. It could be a very effective vehicle uh, that would have, be an income producing vehicle that would be, uh, you know, controlled by the state in, 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 in that sense and run by, you know, whoever. It could be run by the NTMA, it could be run by somebody else. It doesn't uh, bother us uh, where, where it sits. But that's the original intention, Chairman, and it didn't happen. Just, just, just let me conclude one final point in relation to it. When you were answering Deputy Brophy in relation to NARPs, uh, you mentioned, and, and he took up on a slightly different angle, you mentioned that uh, the original NARPs uh, entered agreements with the approved housing bodies. Um, if NARPs too entered agreements with local authorities, would that also be uh, deemed appropriate from the point of view of off-balance sheets, rather than approved housing, housing bodies? I think we said earlier on, it's um, obviously local authorities are on balance sheet, but like other on balance sheet organisations, they can, depending on the joint venture and the actual transaction they engage in, the transaction can actually be off balance sheet. So I think that would be correct. Yeah, yeah. In John. So would you be saying with a degree of confidence that if NARPS 2 were engaging with local authorities rather than approved housing bodies, you would be comfortable to say because NARPS 1 is off balance sheet, NARPS 2 would be off balance sheet? It really, you'd have to see it. I, I, uh, <laughs> I want to hear more. <laughs> just, I just want to hear the answer to this, and then, sorry, we, sorry we, for. We'd have to see the yeah. the actual transaction, sure. and then talk the to the return. Talk to the CSO. There's lots of, and we have to talk to CSO, Eurostat. You know, we, we just. But yet, you can do it for the approved housing bodies. But the approved housing bodies are, are off balance sheet already. So they're not classified with internal government. So that, that piece is still. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I understand. A, a, a key element is control. Yeah. Who, who controls it? And that's why we have to be careful in the sense that. But we, yeah. we, we, we are looking at it, and we are looking at it urgently, and, okay. and we're, we're trying. That's what we're here to do, and that's why we've come up with the idea. We've been meeting for the last six weeks since the minister asked us to, to look at it across the different uh, parts of the business. Yeah. Thank you. Jo, um, um, Deputy O'Sullivan, are you happy at this? Sorry for interrupting you. you will, um, 
purchase for local authorities if they identify properties already in existence? Did you say that earlier? Potentially. Potentially, right. right. Uh, Deputy Ryan. I didn't indicate. Sorry? I didn't indicate. Okay, sorry. Deputy Harty. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> I'm, I'm just struggling with the, the concept, uh, trying to understand what, what are the criteria that distinguish between borrowings being on or off balance sheet. <clears throat> and I think Mr. Redden said that it's very difficult to keep borrowings for social housing off balance sheet, but borrowings for affordable housing with a return could be kept off balance sheet. Um, perhaps you might expand on that. And what government borrowings are off balance sheet at the moment, or what? type of uh, borrowing is off balance sheet? Uh, very simply, if the body is within general government, so the NTMA, the HFA, local authorities, departments, if they borrow money, it's on balance sheet. The borrowing is on balance sheet and it's in our uh, general government debt and obviously then contributes to the debt to GDP ratio. Um, the off balance sheet story is about when you use that money. If you use that money in a way that is classified as general government expenditure, then we start running into, well, it contributes obviously to uh, the deficit calculation on a headline basis. It will contribute to the uh, calculation of the structural balance as well, and it will count towards the, uh, 